Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Cohen, the author of An Introduction to the Art and Science of Chinese Tea Ceremony. Today, we're discussing Book 2, Chapter 7, From Yixing Ore to Zisha Clay. Here to talk about this chapter is our editorial team, Patrick Penny. Hey, hey. And Zong Jun Li. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pat. Hello, Zong Jun. My first question, should ore processing be seen as a technology or art form? You tried to binary as hard. I think it's both. Why so? So much of it involves technical innovation and technological advances, but at its core and, and still to this day, um, the kind of process that we see being done by those who are extremely traditionally bent is, is really more of an artistic form of ore processing than it is one influenced by technology. So I think a lot of the products that we're buying today on the market for Yixing teapots, at least the level of pot that we're looking for express definitely the confluence of, of both. Maybe not at their pinnacle, but I think we're trying to get more and more money to buy ones that are at the, the pinnacle, the confluence of both. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely agree with Pat. Yixing teapot is a form of art too. And the clay is the base material of this art form, which definitely is part of the art. A lot of the processing methods nowadays we've been seeing are also dedicated to adding aesthetic value to the end product. So I would definitely say it's uh, also an art. I think something interesting that this chapter introduces, right, is technological advances, particularly in the milling section, where it shows that with technology, some of these milling and sieving can be done at such a high level to such a fine particle size that's actually detrimental to the final product. And so there's really this balance of having to understand what it is you're trying to execute from an artistic standpoint to understand, I think, correctly what technology to leverage. So it's really fascinating. This chapter actually introduced a lot of new concepts that I didn't know in the processing. Uh, so this is one that maybe it's not the, the biggest page turner, but it's probably one I'm going to come back to a lot. You mentioned ore processing changing over time, the advent of mechanization, the introduction of new technologies. Specifically, how did the increase in mechanization change the industry of Yixing? The one thing that really stuck out to me was the potential decrease in timeline. So the decrease in time from mining your ore to having a finished product due to mechanization. So whereas in the past, withering for top quality, rare ore could be a very long process that involved extended, potentially from what we've heard in the past decades of aging after to now where vacuum is introduced and we can pull all the moisture and air out and know that the product that we are aging does not need as much time, right? And move it down to months or years for some better clays. Just, just that reduction in timeline alone is one of the things that really stands out to me as a, a big change for mechanization. And definitely drastically increase the uh, production of end product clay that are being sold for artists to make into teapots. In the past, the production was at a lower point, which milling processing clay is happening simultaneously with aging. But nowadays, because of the production is so efficient that we've been seeing decreasing quantity of well-aged clay over time in the market, uh, which is kind of sad. But I think the interesting thing is while the actual year age of the clay may be different, is the quality that's been achieved by the aging the same due to the technological advances? I, I don't know the answer to it, but it's something interesting to think about. Pat, you mentioned in your answer that with the level of teapots that we're buying with the accumulation uh, of art and technology that you know, we may not be at the pinnacle, but it's something that we're striving to purchase. That made it sound as if you have a preference for contemporary teapots. Do you believe that the pinnacle is today with these technological advancements, or do you believe that the pinnacle was achieved either during the ROC, uh, maybe earlier in the Qing or later in the F1 period? You know, this is uh, an interesting question, and I think I, I kind of thought it was going to come eventually because we've talked about this a lot. We have had the opportunity through, you know, various outlets such as the now defunct Institute of Penn State and some of the teachers we've had in, in various regions throughout Asia to utilize really high quality antique teapots. We've touched things, you know, from touched and, and seen and got our hands on things from uh, late Qing and Ming and ROC. Those teapots were amazing. I wish I could, you know, side-by-side side them with some of my contemporary pots, 
unfortunately never really got the chance. So I have to go off of experience and memory, but I will say the contemporary pots that Jason, you've been commissioning have performed extremely well in a lot of the tests that we've been doing recently. Without the side-by-side -side reference of some of these masterpiece pots we've had, I can't say for a fact, but just based on some of the factors like availability and price point, I really do have not, not only a preference for uh, these contemporary wares, but I do think that they match up to a lot of the positive experiences and expressions that those older pots had on the tee. I, I do feel like I'm seeing, if not all of that, at least a good percentage of that being expressed through these teapots. Yeah, price is definitely a huge impact thanks to a uh, modernization of technology. I, I mean, definitely. I think there'd be a, another zero or two, you know, on some of the pots that we have used versus the pots that we're currently purchasing. So it's, it's a huge difference. Yeah, it does. I'm quite in agreement with that. I've been very positively impressed with the quality of the teapots that I've commissioned. And what I find interesting is that I use them for different teas than I use the antique pots for. I don't know if I would say that the effects are identical. I do believe that the effects paired with the right teas are positive, but I don't find that I can use the antique teapots with the same teas. All, all teas are very high quality as the, the contemporary teapots. I, and I, I don't yet have an explanation for that. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it is all really interesting. I think the feel maybe and the experience, right? The phenomenology of the older pots is probably something that can't be replaced by contemporary pots because there's so much, obviously, story and history to it. But I think the base T effect is maybe not quite close, but it's strong enough that I'm not missing the extra few thousand dollars I had to spend, right? I'm, my bank account is happy. I'm happy. I can't even afford many of the pots that we have gotten to use in the past. So I'm just very uh, appreciative of the experiences that we got to have. Or was processed into clay throughout China. What did Yixing adapt from other regions and what did other regions adapt from Yixing? Well, one, one interesting thing we've discussed in the past, Jason, you brought this up maybe during our AMA or a previous podcast, but when did Yixing miners decide that they were going to use that difficult ore to work with, right? Instead of all the available workable clay. So assumably the, the idea to mine the ore and to work the ore must have come from somewhere in China. Uh, and I don't know if that was through, you know, a different technology or art, like, you know, metal crafting, metal mining, where that came from. But I assume that that came from somewhere else in China. I don't know specifically where the idea of using the ore versus the easily and readily accessible clay came from. Certainly metal mining far predates the advent of yixing mining, certainly uh, other rare substances such as, such as vermilion dates it by, by quite a bit. So... I don't know if the Chinese craftsmen and artisans would have been afraid or hesitant to approach difficult to work with substance. Potentially the, the difficulty of its processing could have been one of the things that drew them to it. Uh, this requires skill, this requires expertise, not anyone's going to be able to grab this and produce something. But I, I, I don't have an answer for when it started. Other technologies, I think that probably Yixing implemented from other industries or other parts of China. I would also assume that probably milling and a lot of the milling techniques came from other industries. I thought the milling section of this chapter was fascinating. I feel like there was a lot to learn about from a technological standpoint. And so, you know, the ox drawn mills probably, you know, was first used for agriculture before being incorporated into something like clay milling. So I would assume a lot of this milling technology was used somewhere else first. That, that is absolutely the case. Almost all of the milling technology was imported into Yixing. Yixing did not do any innovations themselves on milling. Yeah, and the milling mechanism really changed during the uh, industrial era, and in which people increasingly find that with machines, they can produce extra fine a powder, which actually have a impact on the end result of making a teapot. Because, you know, in teapot, you also need to have some coarse grains in order to have the teapots intact during firing. So pros and cons of using machine versus traditional method. Most ceramic centers in China focus on the production of glaze. How did the lack of glaze influence ore processing in Yixing? With glaze, you definitely have a higher firing temperature, which is going to be much higher than the normal firing temperature for Yixing. Sometimes you will see some slightly glazed Yixing teapot, but it's not super frequent. 
lack of glaze, you can actually have the teapot to have slightly finer powder to begin with, so that you know with a higher temperature the powder won't fully vitrify, which is not desirable for Yixing teapot for usage of tea. Yeah, I think the mental framework that I approached this question with was if we're not going to be doing glazes and we're not going to be focusing on glazes, then you would think that the artisans would probably want to get the most out of the material that they're currently working with, right? So in my mind, if they're not going to work with glaze, it's because they know that they're putting so much time and effort into this clay that glaze isn't required to get the kind of effect that they want. So that's kind of one way that I think about it. Another way could just be that the origin, right, and the, the original usage of this material didn't require glaze to see the effects that people wanted. Maybe, Jason, I don't, I don't think this was covered in the history chapter, but do you think we could have seen any kind of soup or stew type boiling happening in Yixing materials? Oh, interesting. Um, no, there is Yanni cookware, but there is no Yixing cookware. Interestingly, there was a lot of Yixing flower pot and some domestic use, where particularly for lower quality clays, but never for cookware. Gotcha. Um, okay. I was trying to see, you know, if we're not glazing, and if it's not for an aesthetic reason, because it's possible that the local population just aesthetically enjoyed these unglazed wares, and so they continued to purchase it. But if it's not for an aesthetic reason, then I would think that the ultimate output was appreciated by either the local people or those who were economically inclined enough, right, to be buying it. There was certainly an aesthetic preference amongst the literati for the unglazed wares. It was part of the general movement towards not quite wabi-sabi in the later or contemporary Japanese aesthetic movements, but certainly in the idea of, of more rustic tea environments, more basic tea environments. The literati had access to tea wares from Jingdezhen and Dehua and, and, and elsewhere. But the, particularly in the, the Southern literati, much preferred the, the unglaze. My thinking on this question um, is more around the, the processing technique, right? If you, if you have a glaze going over the wear, then you probably need to mill finer. You probably need to soak longer. You probably need to make a less sticky clay in order for the glaze to adhere properly. Glaze lifting, glaze flaking, glaze crazing um, in various times was seen as a negative. And we know that uh, Yixing knew how to create glazes and knew how to, to produce glazes. They had their local Yijun wares, which were glazed wares, sometimes done on something very similar to a Zisha body. There were various attempts at glazing Yixings that, that happened contemporaneously throughout time and never caught on. So it's interesting to think, how did the knowledge that the raw material was going to be preserved in its fired form change the aspects and attributes that they wanted to highlight in it. And I think one of the things is, is the highly textured nature that you run your fingers over good Yixing teapots and there is a grain texture to it, right? If you run it over a, a piece of glaze where it's, it's absolutely smooth, it's not that different than glass. We'll start talking now about the various processing steps, but I think a lot of these processing steps were geared towards a refinement of the textural attributes and frequently the textural attributes over the visual attributes. Yeah, I would say so. And there is a very strong utility component in that because with glaze, you basically <laughs> bring tea in a, in, in, in a gaiwan or in a glassware. You are definitely, uh, you know, missing the component of yixing being a uh, interreactive function in brewing tea. Because you're basically sealing uh, Yixing away from being in contact with the tea uh, inside the teapot. The steps of ore processing are sorting, weathering, milling, sieving, dry purification, mixing and setting, working, aging, and reworking. What I'd like to do now is run through each of these steps in turn. We'll go round robin, give a brief explanation, one or two sentences explanation of what it is, and then might ask a follow-up question. And this is slightly based on, on what you had mentioned, Pat, that a lot of the information, you know, that you, you, you can find texts in English now that state these steps, but frequently with either a lack of detail or a lack of nuance in what the step is trying to, to achieve. Um, so let's start with you uh, on sorting. So sorting is basically you get your raw material from your mine yield and you're just trying to take out impurities. So that could be dirt or whatever else you'd find in a mine, pebbles, stone, stuff that's not yixing zisha ore. And you're trying to take out or sort into specific types of ore. So maybe you're trying to get all of one kind of zisha ore together, 
and all of another so that when you're starting to process it, the material is reacting to processing in a similar way so that you can have a consistent and workable material. What changed in sorting from the Qing to F1 era? I assume that we probably had technology that was able to do some of this sorting. Today, I'm sure there's visual robotics that could do this. I don't think it's probably being employed, but I'm assuming that as we got further and further on through time, that the specialists who were doing this were more and more specific about the kind of sorting that was happening. So they would sort into finer subcategories, probably of different ore. Until the F1 period, when they... It all went into a big bulk batch. <laughs> yeah. Everyone loves their F1. By major category, right? They they separated Junian Hongli and Luni and Guangli, but they, they did not go down into the into the subcategories or into the very specific categorizations that, that had built up over time in the Qing and ROC. All ores are created equally. <laughs> Zongjun, weathering. Sure. So uh, weathering is basically you let the ore sit for a longer period of time. Initial weatherings frequently happened on site, in the mining site, and uh, additional weatherings usually happened after the ores got purchased by their distributor or ceramist themselves. And you just let them sit, usually under the sun, and sometimes will be under the shade, and you let the wind blows on it, you let rain to rain on it, and the ore will slowly to decompose, and a lot of fermentation would slowly happen and kind of uh, decompose all the organic matter inside the clay, and then make it more workable, make it more you know easy to manipulate in the following processes. Are all types of ores weathered? Oh, uh, yeah, mostly. Some are easier to weather, some are not. How did it look like you disagree? According to the chapter, at least, this is not something that I knew beforehand. So I'm not gloating over you, but uh, Juni uh, was not weathered according to the chapter. Juni slacks in water, so it would just wash away in a, in a weathering process. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. Totally missed that. <laughs> it's a trick question, Zongjun. I knew I was going to get you. <laughs> New knowledge to me, Zongjun. Don't worry. Pat Milling. Yeah, I was actually going to push this one back on you because this is a really nuanced section of the chapter and you cover a lot of technology in this. So... I know the basics, but I'd love for you to add some color. So when we're milling, we're just looking to reduce the particle size down to something that is uh, workable and will yield ultimately the artistic good we're looking for. So your milling is going to influence everything that has to do with shaping and making the wear, like its plasticity, the strength of porosity. But you covered a lot of different milling technologies in this, and I, I thought that, that was very interesting, but I'd love to maybe hear a little bit more about it from you. Yeah, I, I totally agree. This was one of the more interesting sections to to write in this chapter. And it was one of the more it was one of the more difficult to write because of the nuance in the technology and the overlapping time periods in which in which the technology was used. So ore milling started with just hammer milling, two words, which you literally just take a hammer and crush the ore. And that obviously does not produce a particularly normal distribution of particle sizes. It might produce a uniform distribution, flat distribution of particle sizes, because everything's just going to fracture along natural lines. It's not going to have a lot of control over the particle shape. And so that technique is still actually done as a pre-step of loading ore into stone mill grinders. And those stone mill grinders were originally used for grain, and then they became used for medicines and other plant materials that had been dried. And then finally, they were used in ore production. And that can be driven by hand or by now a mechanized belt. And that's how a lot of the high-end, highest quality ore still processed today. And that produces a fairly spherical or ovoid particle size distribution. It produces very rounded particle shape distribution. It produces a very normal distribution of particle sizes and it's it's pretty easy to to judge whether or not your milling is going well and simply to remill things if you want it to be slightly finer from there you saw the advent of both hammer mills which one word where they were rotated around in a drum and the ore struck a bar a stationary bar and would shatter and it would do this at high speeds or ball milling where you load the ore up into a chamber and rotate it and there's heavy iron balls that would sometimes actually shed iron material into the material and produces far too fine of a particle size distribution. Ball milling is, is frequently what's done to create metal powders. So it can, it can produce incredibly fine work. 
And then you had Raymond mills and Raymond mills are very high throughput horizontal roller mills that have two horizontal metal rollers that spin very quickly and crush the ore. And that is still in use today, but it produces a very flat and jagged part of shape, which creates an interlocking structure, which is much less preferred for both the workability of it and also the resulting texture on the, the surface. It creates for kind of um, almost a sandpapery surface, but not in the traditional shark skin or pear skin way. It's a, it's a notably aligned material latticed sandpaper surface. So that's not used for the highest end clays. And all of this happened in a very, very short period of time. You had your hammer milling and your and your stone milling that were taking place from the Ming all the way to the ROC. There was also the particle mills that were used in other areas, particularly for kowloon clay, so the, the ox-driven or the cow-driven circular mills, and those were used for yixing, although now they seem to have fallen out of favor. But everything else there happened from the ROC through the F1 period. And so you had quite a bit of technological innovation happening in a very short period of time. And it greatly changed the, the surface texture and the qualities of the materials made there. And now you're seeing this return to traditional methodologies, fungu, in Yixing for the highest quality ores. I, I just thought, yeah, this was, this was really a fascinating chapter to, to write. Yeah, I think this is the section that I, I reread the most too, because I was kind of going through and I was like trying to mentally distinguish between the different action on the ogre from the different types of milling, which uh, took took a little bit of, of diving into. I had to do some of my own research too, but just re really interesting to see just how quickly, as you said, all this technology was kind of implemented. And here we are, you know, a few decades after the ROC and people are going back for the highest quality teapots and for milling of the highest quality ore. Yeah, it was an interesting section to research too, because uh, a lot of these technology were originated from other industries like coal milling and coal harvesting. So we end up learning a lot about how to process coal. Maybe that will be uh, useful during winter. <laughs> or the later chapter on fire and yishin wares. <laughs> yeah, all the fun. Well, Zongjun, the next section is to you, sieving. Pretty straightforward. It's basically how you are trying to select specific sizes of particles dedicated to different you know, types of design, different types of teapots, and also trying to get rid of certain impurities coming from the milling process. For example, roll millers or rima millers tend to produce a lot of very fine iron powder, which doing sifting, people would sometimes use magnets or filters to try to uh, sift out those impurities. You started to talk about dry purification in there as well as sieving. The dry purification, particularly for iron, frequently uses strong magnets. How old is the use of magnets in Yixing? Is that a modern innovation or were they using magnets to remove iron back in the, the Ming and other, other areas? Yeah, I, I would definitely say it's a modern innovation because iron impurities are actually pretty hard to have a magnetism effect with the magnets. So you definitely need uh, electric coil to be able to generate stronger magnetism to, uh, to get rid of those impurities. Natural magnets will not do any good. And is that also because not all of the iron in the Yixing powder is magnetic? That's also the case. And sometimes there could be iron oxidates that are not very attractive to magnets, which it's pretty hard to get rid of uh, with just using magnets. Just maybe for the audience, why, why are we trying to get rid of iron and some of these other impurities? Yeah, that's a good question. So for some level of iron inside the clay, you would have all the beautiful color shades of red for like Honey and Juni. But for larger iron impurities, uh, you frequently will cause iron explosion on the surface of the teapot, will create like craters or sometimes even holes, which is definitely not desirable. At mixing and setting. Yeah, so you've got your sieved material, you've pulled everything out of it that you no longer want in there. And I think mixing and setting additionally had kind of like a wet purification step that could be a part of it. But basically you're mixing this material that's been sieved in with water, you're trying to achieve the right level of uh, hydration. And then once it's kind of hydrated, you're able to, uh, as I mentioned, that go through that wet purification, which can similarly leverage magnets to pull out materials as it's kind of flowing in a thin slurry or thin stream. And then I think additionally from there setting, 
So basically, once you've got the slurry, you're kind of getting it all kind of pressed together and leaving it out to like just evenly distribute the moisture content. So reach some kind of equilibrium throughout the slurry mixture. So the way I think of it, and maybe it's not totally correct, seeing this powder and water that's slowly kind of mixing into a wet paste um, and the paste is getting kind of thinner and thinner as you go and add more water. And then eventually you reach something that looks like a giant, slightly wet slab of clay. And often the way I've seen that is uh, it's kind of usually wrapped up in plastic. So I don't know, Jason, is this the point where we would kind of see things starting to be wrapped up? Or is this just like a um, open tub of wet soaked clay? Open tub of wet soaked clay. It needs to go through the working phase before it gets wrapped. Gotcha. Uh, and there, there's an interesting thing that you mentioned in this process, and that's that at this point, you go finally from ore and powdered ore into clay. And so what's the property here that develops in this phase of processing that really is the transformation that, that we go from ore to clay? The way that I think about it, at least I don't know if this is correct, but once we've added water and once we've kind of allowed the clay to set the ore, I mentioned ore at the beginning, and then now clay to set, right? It has become something that is workable with your hands is the way I look at it. So the ore was just a, a powder, well, it was a rock, right? And then it was a powder. And now that it has been combined with water, it is something that is moldable and shapeable into a wear. Maybe not at this exact moment, but that transition really just happens in this step. So that's how I look at it. The addition of water in the process, it's, uh, it's the key. Well, it's, it's the key to the property, right? The, the property is that the material now sticks to itself. Yeah. And so by adding water and allowing it to set at the correct hydration, the material creates those bonds and it's able to stick to itself. And, and now you have clay material. Zongjun, working. So this process is you basically trying to, you know, slap and condense and uh, rub the clay, just like how you're rubbing a bread dough. It condensed the clay together and make it more homogeneous and uh, preparing for molding in two wares. So here again, we have a process that's been fully mechanized. What are the range of processing options from least mechanized to most mechanized available for working? For traditional working, you're basically using, well, the most traditional ones, you're basically using your hands. But then later on, people start to introduce more tools, for example, wood hammers or wood slaps to give it additional force to extrude all the airs out from the clay itself. And then later on, you have mechanized machines like vacuum pumps or extruders to further enhance that process, which to a point that people start to find that the machines are doing too well and they are making the texture of the clay too homogeneous and, you know, extruding too much air out of the clay, which the end product is a super homogeneous, super fine and lack of characteristic kind of clay. So nowadays for higher end teapots, more traditional methods are actually desired. Although in this chapter, I do argue for a, a balance and the use of extruders and vacuum pumps. Some of the particularly small runs of very high end clay might be hand processed, mallet processed, but it doesn't seem to have the same negative, necessarily negative impact that Raymond milling, for example, has. Pat, aging. Yay, now the clay is all wrapped up in a bag. Finally, I get to put it in plastic, but it's basically wrapped and allowed to sit in a uh, potentially now in modern times, a temperature controlled environment. But I would assume before just somewhere that the temperature was relatively stable. And this is where you're going to continue to have like decomposition of any organic material. You're going to have impurities potentially either floating to the surface or mo moving out towards the surface. I'm sure that there's a lot of kind of bonds being formed, uh, things being degraded. So like hydrolysis, oxidation, this is where all your fun chemical processes are going to go on. And the whole reason that this is done is just so that the end result, the end clay achieves the degree of shapeability and workability and the, the proper texture that the craftsman is ultimately looking for. I argue in this chapter that the decrease in aging time in modern processing has not necessarily resulted in lower quality clay because of the more thorough mechanized working in the previous step. How would you argue for or against that position? I think that my argument would be for in so much that we are not seeing maybe the same final result. So traditional processing methods versus modern processing methods. I don't think that they're yielding the exact same thing. But I don't think that there is a uh, 
a significant difference in those that are done properly, right? Both well done traditional, well done contemporary processing. I think the well done contemporary processing is allowing us to get to a similar place that creates a product that tea lovers like us are going to enjoy using and it gets there in less time. So I don't, I don't see the harm in it. Probably more efficient, right? For the craftsmen, more economically beneficial for them uh, and economically beneficial for us. If it takes less time, it probably is more affordable. So I see that there being an economic net win for everyone. I don't know. I, I take a more neutral view on this topic because for aging and for the young two process, you do have natural fermentation happening, uh, which generates some organic acids, which definitely will have an eventual impact on the texture. And I think that that cannot be really replaced by changing of the previous uh, methods. So I would say for longer period of aging, it would definitely still have a more positive impact to, uh, to the clay even for modern process clay, even for clay that's been through vacuum pumps and extruders, you believe that longer aging will still have a better outcome? I would say so. It's a, it sounds like we have an experiment is, uh, we need to do. Yeah. <laughs> the next commission, commission number three. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good argument, right? The argument is that biological processes, natural processes take a certain amount of time and the, the previous steps don't change that. So if you want salts to rise to the surface, you have to wait. If you want remnant organic compounds to break down and turn into natural acids that are going to increase the vibrancy of the color, you have to wait. And that's a very good argument. I think then, then it's a question of, is the benefit from properly run contemporary processing vacuum pumps and extruders enough to overcome the limitations of a shorter aging? And so far, the industry answer to that, the Yishin craftsman answer to that has been yes. But I don't, I don't have any counter argument to, to your argument. I would say that even contemporarily processed clays would likely benefit from longer durations of aging. We can't see anything wrong with that argument. Is there a possibility to overage? I have never read of anyone claiming that a clay is overaged. Considering that the clay started as a 10,000 year, 100,000 year longer material in the earth from ashes to ashes, dust to dust, uh, we will return. Yeah. Uh, I have a trouble believing that on the order of human lifespans, the order of human civilization, we're going to overage this clay will reach a level that now has a detrimental effect to the teapot. Well, that also sounds like commission number five. Maybe we, uh, we won't get there in our lifetime, but maybe someone will get to uh, experience it. Aged clay time capsule. I love it. Yeah. From a personal preference standpoint, certainly I've had whiskeys that I felt reached a level of maturity that were no longer as interesting as they could have been. To me, you know, there's definitely that cutoff somewhere above the 20 year mark where I find that things kind of fall off. And I was curious if we do see something similar in clay, but your explanation makes a lot of sense. Our final step. Reworking and texture adjustment. Basically at this part, after a long time period of uh, aging, finally the clay is ready to be used. So at this point, artists will try to paint the clay as a blank canvas and additional features to it based on their own preferences. So you can rework the clay to kind of ensure that there's a more evenly distribution of all the uh, material inside the clay. And also with texture adjustments, you frequently will see people start doing Kelsha at this point, adding different colors of other minerals or clay into the base material clay, or sometimes adding Shusha or what they call ripe sand or pre-fired Zisha material to enhance certain features in the clay. Excellent. That covers all of the stages of Yixing processing. Well, everyone, that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you for joining us in this edition of Tea Technique Editorial Conversations. Please join us again for our next conversation, specific Yixing ores and Zisha clay. Mm -hmm.